Is it live or just recording? It's recording, no streaming. Oh, okay, okay, perfect. Um, how many of you know what Lesser is? Okay, good. How many of you have actually used it for anything? Okay, a couple of you. How many of you have tried to use it, failed, and went something else? A few times. Don't be shy. <laughs> There's more than one of you. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, how many of you are using Ceph? Okay, how many of you are using some type of NFS uh, thing? To kind of, okay, a couple of you. Few. Whether those NFS services are for over NetApp, EMC, or whatever. How many of you use NetApp? Okay, EMC? Are those, are those Isilon or some other type of EMC? Uh, so using Celera to serve. Okay. Old EMC stuff. Okay, cool. Um, excellent. So, so what we've noticed in the last uh, year or so is that there's a lot of interest in using uh, LusterFS in conjunction with all the cloudy tools like OpenStack, CloudStack, Open Nebula. I just talked to Open Nebula guy previously about that. Um, they're even Gennetti, uh, they're looking at doing integration with LusterFS. Um, there's a good news and bad news situation there. The bad news is about a year ago, uh, I would have told you not to do that. <laughs> um, the good news is that since that time, we've actually made a concerted effort to, to add that functionality to GhostFS so that for virtual block storage, you can actually use GhostFS in conjunction with OpenStack Sender, um, with the uh, other types of you know, virtual image management on a distributed file system. Um, but I'll, I'll get into more of that in more detail later. Uh, but first of all, you may have a uh, some, we'll give you a little background about how we started. Uh, we started about 2006, 2007. Uh, we had a bunch of engineers, not a bunch, like 10, who did a cluster management software. And they went on this, uh, uh, so they were not a storage company. They, they did cluster management. And they put together, I think, uh, Thumper or Thunder, which was, at the time was the second largest uh, uh, cluster in the world. And then they had a project in Venezuela with an energy company, an oil company, oil and gas company. And when they went there, they said, yeah, yeah, your cluster management software is all fine, but our real problem is how do we aggregate all of our storage in a way that's accessible to everyone and we can actually you know, expand it when we need to and make it accessible. And they said, okay, sure, yeah, we can do that. And you know, as, as any cash-strap startup will do, they'll say, yes, we can do that. Uh, and they were given a time frame of six months. So they had six months to implement this uh, expandable storage system. And they thought, well, we'll just use something off the shelf. We'll use, uh, we'll buy something or we'll, we'll install something that will work or, or not work, in this case may be. And they discovered, much to their chagrin, that there was nothing at the time that would work to do what they wanted to do. It was either too expensive or it was not uh, expandable, would not scale out enough, would not be able to uh, encompass all the data they need to store. I think they had something like two petabytes at the time, which in 2006 is pretty substantial. Uh, the, the, the point being that they tried things like Lustre and other tools off the shelf. They looked at things like you know, what EMC had to offer at the time. And the conclusion, that came, the conclusion they came to was, in order for us to be within our budget, they had to write it themselves. And that was, that was an undertaking that they didn't know how much work it was at the time. Like any great open source project, they didn't quite understand the links of the problem when they set out to solve it. Uh, the same thing, with, you could say the same thing about uh, Linux, the Linux kernel. Linus Torvalds didn't know quite what he was getting into uh, when he set out to write a kernel from scratch. So they didn't know what they were doing, uh, but they knew what they were going to do it. <laughs> um, because it was the best choice they had at the time. And so what they ended up doing was, in six months, they created this, uh, essentially a Lego toolkit for putting together distributed storage systems. And that element of GlusterFS, the Lego toolkit that you can hack with and really do whatever you want with it, still exists. Of course, it's hidden today under layers of uh, usability, but it's very much there, and it's very much uh, for the taking uh, if you want to get down dirty with the bits. But that's what they did. In six months, they created a system uh, and oh, by the way, the, 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 the key performance point was it had to be faster than, than, than tape backup. As long as you were faster than tape backup, uh, you, were, you were fine. Uh, and that was, that was sort of the defining characteristic. Um, 
But that's after six months is what they had. They had something that was faster than tape, uh, could be used to expand uh, a volume uh, for Gloucester FS as they wanted. Uh, it could scale out to many petabytes. Uh, although at the time they were very much limited in the sort of uh, a cluster, in the sort of uh, uh, ability to to scale the management nodes, but uh, it could scale. And it was, in fact, I think over time we've measured that GlowSurfS scales out uh, better than any other open source uh, distributed file system. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of the history and background of how we started. Uh, and while they were going through this process, they realized that, you know, this is way too complicated than it needs to be. Storage should not be this big, honking, complex thing uh, that you have to pay you know, millions of dollars for you know, every year. Storage should be something that you install just like any other enterprise application. Whether it's virtualization software or some other type of software, it should be no different from that. You should be able to just install it and go. And that was sort of like the big uh, piece of insight they had here. And they thought, and that's the moment they became a storage company. And they made that realization that this was the way forward for them. It was a real problem, uh, and it was something that they felt that, that they could solve. Um, and given that it was 2006, kind of a big deal because, you know, the compute side of the enterprise had just been going towards virtualization. Uh, the data side, the storage side, took a long time to evolve in that direction. And there's a good reason for that. It's because, you know, storage admins are notoriously conservative about their data. And that's a good thing because if they weren't conservative, they end up losing it all the time, which would be really bad for a storage admin. That's a really good way to lose your job if you, if you don't care about the, the data that you're uh, you know, trying to administer. Um, whereas on the compute side, on the virtualization side, you know, you can lose compute nodes all day, any day, and you can still spin them back up. And as long as you've saved the state in a safe storage place, it doesn't matter. You can spin the compute back up, another one, and just go. Storage is different. You have to have the, uh, uh, the failover built in. You have to be able to, if you do lose a storage node, you'd better have a good plan in place for how you're going to reinstate that, that storage node or have some good replication built in or redundancy built in so that you can fail over to the other, uh, the other replicas that you have. So it's inherently more conservative market uh, and it's something you have to prepare for. Uh, I guess you have to be more careful about preparing for it. So that's a long-winded way of saying that storage took a long time to get to the same point where we were say, 10 years ago with software virtualization. Now we're getting to the point where the economics have caught up a bit, and now we can have a bunch of storage nodes uh, cheaply administered and deployed uh, with open source software and commodity hardware, uh, and you can do all these different things with it. What is the best, best unified distributed storage system? Um, you can, it's a user space, it's a, one of the defining characteristics. That is a de design decision we made very early on. It's going to be user space. Uh, it's easier to hack on that way. Uh, also, it means we can implement our own sort of uh, memory management, um, bypass some of the, the kernel things. Um, we still have to, for our cluster best client, we still have to use the Linux kernel to, uh, to use the uh, Fuse module that we use to mount the file system over network. Uh, we've actually developed some things to bypass the Fuse module. If you're interested in hearing about that, and I'll get into that later. The GF API uh, library, client library. Um, we've we've always believed in a global namespace, the ability to create a, a volume that encompasses multiple storage nodes, multiple storage bricks that you can attach to you from anywhere. Um, stackable, meaning that uh, so in user space we have uh, all the features are implemented in things that we call translators. And translators are implemented in user space in a stack of libraries, .so files. And those are how we implement things like uh, uh, distributed volumes, distributing data over multiple nodes, uh, how we implement uh, replication, uh, open S our OpenSSL integration. Anything that you want to implement in GlusterFS is implemented via a translator, and it's a stack of translators that the data passes through. I'll have a, I have a diagram for that later. Um, how many of you are familiar with GNU Herd? Yeah, all right. Um, GNU Herd, for those who don't know, is a microkernel architecture operating system. It was going to be Richard Stallman's uh, magnum opus, uh, where all the, the great GNU ideals came together to form the, 
the toll decree operating system. Uh, it never quite worked out that way, but there are a lot of great design ideas in GNU Herd. Uh, first and foremost were the stackable uh, user space libraries called translators. Uh, and there was a data path and everything was treated as a file. And it was kind of very similar design-wise. And there's a good reason for that because one of the committers to the GNU Herd project was A.D. Periosomy, who went on to, went on to co-found uh, Gluster, incorporated in the Gluster FS project. So he borrowed all the nomenclature and the design ideas from GNU Herd and applied them into a storage context. It was a very uh, interesting uh, approach. So no data silos. Um, we don't believe that, so these are very core uh, design principles that really make up the essence of what GlusterFS is. And when it comes to no data silos, we really are unique in that regard. There are two things that really set us apart from uh, everyone else. One is this, no data, no data silos. Uh, and by that we mean that whatever data you have, it should be available irrespective of format, irrespective of uh, protocol and access method, meaning that if you use one access protocol or use one protocol to access to write the data, you should be able to read and write from the same data set using some other access method, using some other protocol. So if you store data via the, uh, the Swift API for object storage, you should be able to utilize that same data over NFS or over the GlusterFS mount point or some other uh, mount point. Um, the data should be the data uh, attachable via many different means. You shouldn't be limited by the protocol you used uh, just because you, you know, wanted to store data in one protocol doesn't mean that it should be excluded from some other type of protocol. So we are really are the only solution to, to, uh, that allows you to do this. Uh, there are other solutions that allow you to have file, object, and block access, but those are siloed components. Uh, very rarely do they allow you to access them from uh, uh, different methodologies. So, so that's one core principle. Um, the other is the, the no single point of failure. We, very early on, we decided that we would not use a metadata server. And the reason we would not use a metadata server is that we found uh, in our testing from the very early days is that using a metadata server limited you in a couple of different ways. The first way it limited you was uh, if you use a metadata server, you were limited by the amount of memory take, uh, that um, was allocated to <coughs> the metadata service or server. Because a metadata server or service runs in memory just so it's fast enough to be able to keep up with your data requests. The second thing that's wrong with the metadata server was if it fails, if, it, if the index is corrupted, then you lose access to the data that it refers you to. And so this is, it becomes a single point of failure. We don't like single points of failure, so we did it with the metadata server. And the way we did it was we created uh, uh, something based on a DHT algorithm that we call the elastic hash because you know everything has to be elastic and cloudy in, the, in this century. Um, called the uh, elastic hash, it's based on a DHT algorithm. It allows us to bypass um, allows us to bypass a metadata server, and it does so by uh, creating a hash based on a files and metadata. And we store the hash in the extended attributes of the files, and also in the directories that are along the path to a file. So whenever you read or write data, you calculate that hash, you look up the file um, for reading or writing, and that's how we keep track of any kind of file over very many uh, server nodes in a, in a cluster volume. It's, um, it's a lot cheaper computationally to do that than, say, looking up on a metadata server and doing the, uh, the round trip from the metadata server to the data and then back to the, the request. So, any questions about anything I've mentioned so far? Um, and the third design goal, uh, design uh, principle that we uh, hold dear is the global namespace. And this kind of goes back to the data silos. And when you create a cluster volume, it should, if it encompasses multiple nodes, it should be this you know, big piece blob of what we call a content cloud. Uh, everyone else that insert the word cloud and everything these days. Uh, but it's a big blob of content um, that should encompass multiple server nodes, multiple storage nodes, and they should have content, uh, access uh, from many different clients. But uh, whether you deploy that cluster volume 
uh, in a public cloud or locally on brick metal uh, or on uh, virtual machines on the KVM hypervisor, it should look and act and behave the same and should be accessible to the same types of applications no matter where it's deployed. So, so there have been a lot of changes in the last two years. I was part of the Gluster acquisition. I was at Gluster when, when Red Hat bought us and uh, I'm still here. Uh, so are many others. We have, um, I think at the time we were acquired, we had maybe 20, 30 people in Bangalore uh, who were the core engineering team members of GlusterFS. We've since then expanded the number of engineers working on GlusterFS tremendously. Uh, I think we've doubled the number of people in Bangalore. We've also added people in Mountain View, California, and uh, Westford, Massachusetts, and a few others around the world. I think we've tripled the team. We've added a QE team. It's a significantly different team and process from what we had two years ago. You know, whereas two years ago we had some, uh, frankly, software that may not have been ready for release, uh, we've fixed a lot of the problems that went into that, and so now the releases are much stronger, uh, the software is much better, and hopefully you can see the difference. Uh, we've also gone with a, a shorter release cycle of about six months. Um, and we've, uh, as a point of emphasis, we've started looking at, looking outwardly into you know, what kind of software should we be integrating with, and that's one of the other things we get into later. Um, just shows you a little bit of the performance graph. We've all heard of benchmarking. We all know benchmarking is not exactly a science, or kind of is, but uh, depends on how you do it. Uh, but for a very common workload, um, we perform pretty well when compared to uh, some other open source alter alternatives. This just shows you kind of the design, um, the architecture of what a Gluster FS deployment looks like. If you look at uh, on the bottom here, I have four storage nodes. Uh, we have a distributed replicated uh, volume, uh, meaning that uh, uh, a volume distributed over two nodes and then replicated to other nodes. And you can see um, you know, across the network, uh, we have all these different methods for connecting to a cluster volume. So we have you know, we implemented an NFS v3 server in GlusterFS, uh, or you can connect via the, uh, uh, the GlusterFS client, which uses the uh, Linux Fuse module on the client. Um, and recently, with 3.4, we added the GF API. And what GF API does is it allows any kind of software stack on the client to integrate with GlusterFS and speak directly to the Gluster volume. And by doing that, it bypasses the Fuse uh, module entirely. Um, and so I'll get into some of the, the details of that, but uh, suffice to say that for <coughs> specific workloads, uh, it can perform much better than the Fuse module. Um, for, for the common workloads, uh, not so much. It's performance basically the same. Um, but for specific things, like essentially where you have high random I.O., uh, it performs much better because the latency is lower. Or I should say the latency of each lookup is lower. And then to explore, expound on that a bit further, uh, you can see sort of how uh, the different clients connect to uh, the base uh, storage nodes. Uh, one of the things we pride ourselves on is the ability of the GlusterFS client to be uh, cluster aware, as we say, meaning that if a replica goes down on the storage node side, uh, the client is aware and can direct traffic to a node that will respond. Um, whether reading or writing. Uh, the same thing with GIF API. The, the uh, client library is built with that same capability in mind. The only thing that doesn't function like that is the NFS v3 client, which is a uh, function of the NFS v3 protocol. Um, NFS v4 is supposed to fix that, uh, and we have a, an ongoing integration with Ganesha, uh, which is a, a user space NFS v4 server, I think implemented by some IBM engineers. Uh, are you familiar with Ganesha at all? Okay, kind of. I, I don't know how many people have actually used it for anything real, but I've, it seems like a nice... I've tested it. I, I don't dare put it in production. So no. Yeah, that's not something that I would do yet. Um, so, uh, but this year, this is the year of NFS 4. <laughs> <laughs> and next year, next year will be the year of NFS 4. It's kind of like the Linux desktop. It uh, is always on the way. Um, so, anyway, any questions about the, uh, yes? 
What's the underlying storage and the storage servers? Oh, sorry, yes. So uh, GlowSurfS is essentially an overlay, um, and we work in conjunction with disk file systems that support extended attributes. So when I talked about how you know, we store the, uh, the DHT hash into the extended attributes, that kind of uh, assumes that the file system, the underlying file system, supports uh, extended attributes. So that's XFS, DHT4. Uh, there are some people who use it with ZFS, sorry, ZFS. Uh, there are, um, it, yeah, and, and there are a couple of the ButterFS uh, can also be used. And the, one of the, um, the key things about ButterFS is that we don't modify the underlying disk, disk file system. So if you uninstall uh, GlossRFX, you can still access the files just like any other local file system. Um, we don't modify the, the file system, uh, and we store files atomically on the different server nodes so that if you need to access them without Gluster, you can do that. It's one of the, it's sort of the, one of the uh, way we, how you can manage risk better. But this replication, you can set a replication policy. Yes. And can, it be, can it be geographically distributed? We have a, uh, yes, we have a, so the default replication is synchronous, and we don't recommend that be done um, over wide areas, but there's another uh, replication piece called geo-replication, uh, which allows you to replicate volumes. Right now it's master-slave, so it's one is, one is read-only, um, but, uh, but yeah, over, over flaky connections or connections that you don't know will always, are not reliable, uh, it's a good way to uh, to, cop, uh, to replicate the volume to another location. I'm, I'm all thinking on a, a disaster recovery. Yes. Yeah. yeah. One, one That's exactly what's if very important. If you're storing of data in one of them, yeah. lines, you want another copy. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what's great. And in fact, we um, we just rewrote it. So for uh, 3.5, which I'll get into later, uh, we have a rewritten uh, geo replication uh, uh, feature that uh, should be better. So. <laughs> How can I reach the other uh, Yes, sorry. So the replication is it on the brick level or on the file level? It's on the file level. So we uh, basically we re replicate each. Uh, we, re re we replicate everything that's on a brick, which our definition of a brick is a directory that we export. So it's all the files on that directory are, are replicated to another. Um, and when we heal files, I'm sorry. When we heal a volume, uh, you know that, or when we heal a replicated node that, you know, for whatever reason went down and came back up, um, the healing process is file by file. So that should tell you something. In your graph you had break 3 and break 3, but are, they, uh, are the files that are stored on the left break 3 always on the, on the right break 3, or are they yes. distributed? Uh, we'll see, um, yes, so they are, they are exact replicas of each other. So, uh, so, what, so on the uh, on the two nodes on the right here, um, those are exact replicas of you know, the two nodes on the left. And so you have a you have a volume that's distributed over these two, and then replicated on these two over here. So the underlying storage has to be the same size for those replicas. Ah, uh, for the replicas, yes. I mean, you can have different size bricks for you know a distributed volume, uh, but for the replicas, yeah, it's you, it's a good idea. To I, I think the policies will prevent you from doing something stupid, but uh, or at least they'll warn you. Uh, but for but for distributed volume, uh, it's it's not as you know. Stuff. Just for just presenting you because the small size, I, if the file systems are different in size. It's only presenting the file system of the small size. Um. <clears throat> well, that's okay. Well, I mean, it's, so when it so in this distributed replicated volume example. It will show you the file system that uh, is or these two joint combined. So it'll it'll say it'll say you have this much space available, and that space will be a combination of the bricks that are on these two nodes. And then the um, and then because these are the exact rep replica, uh, you know, it'll be the, the same size available. Well, I, I'm I'm dealing with in, in two uh, uh, replicated uh, synchronous replication uh, Synchronously replicated, and I copied some files on negative on the file system, uh -huh. and so the other side increased too. Oh, yeah, that you although should never do that. Mirrored, <laughs> although, it was not, although it was not mirrored, so that, uh, what, it, what it reported was a, a, a decrease, a global decrease of the, of the volume. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we, we, one of the, 
Yeah, one of the first things we tell people is never to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just for this. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good test. That's interesting. I, I always wondered what actually happened when you do that. Good to know. No, 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 no. In, in the motor director, yeah, I, I copied it. In the motor director, the motor director of the brick, I copied it uh, somewhere else. Oh, okay. On the volume, not in the brick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun to, to play with. Um, so we have a, a lot of different, so I mentioned like, you know, no data silos, different access methods. This kind of breaks down all the different access methods we have on the different interfaces. So on the client side, you can see we have four different types of file interfaces, uh, the SMB protocol, and by SMB we mean whatever Samba supports, um, because it works in conjunction with, with Samba. Uh, Fuse uh, is, is is how the native BlastRFS client uh, accesses files. Um, NFS, because we implemented an NFS v3 uh, server, uh, and ECFS, because we also implemented a, um, a Hadoop integration uh, where basically uh, Hadoop can sort files on a Bluster volume uh, because it thinks, because we were acting like HCFS. Um, on the block side, we have a QMU integration that I'll go into more detail later. Uh, we also have a Cinder integration with, uh, with OpenStack. Um, also, we're also currently working on an iSCSI integration, so you can use cluster volumes as an iSCSI target. Uh, we're also working on a, a cloud stack integration, so you can manage uh, volumes uh, using cloud stack. So this exciting stuff is on the way. Um, we also support uh, the Swift uh, API on the client side. We're actually um, uh, collaborating with the Swift project, so we're using the same Swift client as everyone else. Uh, so it also means that to the extent that the Swift client supports the S3 API, then we also support the S3 API. Uh, Lidge API, again, is our client library, so you can integrate with whatever you want. Uh, the transport, we support both IP and RDMA. Uh, the RDMA side is less tested than IP, so if you want to try it out on RDMA, I would certainly uh, welcome that. Um, and on the back, so yes. Also worth yeah. oh, yes, I'm sorry, yes. It is, is, it, it is supported by Red Hat on their uh, Red Hat storage server. Also. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's supported by Red Hat. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. So, uh, <laughs> on the back end, uh, <laughs> so have, have I mentioned that I represent Gloucester.org and there, uh, there's like a, a firewall between my side, what I do, and what the Red Hat storage guys do. Um, and that's, that's to protect both of us. Uh, we call it church and state. You know, I, I represent church, they represent state, and we, we try not to if you have, Yes? Well, one of the big, biggest problems at the Red Hat storage is uh, we got a Red Hat shop. Yeah. Uh, and I had the idea of all our servers that aren't used to also expose some of them that don't use storage at all. Oh, really? To, yeah, that's pretty common, I guess. But at Red Hat storage is a bit difficult to do that, licensing wise. Well, uh, if you want me to introduce you to, uh, I'm assuming you're working with somebody, but if you want, you know, I'm more than happy to, to get you to the right person if you, if you need further exploration. Um, and on the back side, on the back end side, uh, the most common uh, back end is, you know, supporting files, uh, but we also have a new block device translator um, that was contributed by IBM engineers, so thank you IBM. And there's a very old uh, libdb translator that no one uses, but if someone were to pick that back up, I would be really uh, grateful, and I would give you all the free t-shirts you could ever want in your life. So, <laughs> um, as I mentioned, no metadata server, uh, elastic cache using the a DHT algorithm, um, distributed multiple servers, both protocol access, I already talked about all this stuff, uh, all right. Um, Oh, product of self-healing. So if, uh, if you have a replicated volume and one of the nodes goes down, uh, when it comes back up and rejoins the uh, server peers, it will pull the other replica to see what needs to be uh, healed back to the other, other node. Um, in general, we pride ourselves on being the easiest uh, distributed storage system to manage and deploy. Uh, so this means that in about four commands, you can have a, a cluster up and running. Um, they're basically just, you know, um, yeah, after you, assuming you have it installed, um, those four uh, command pieces will basically have you, have you up and running. 
Uh, the only caveat being that you have to run them on, on every server that you want to be part of the storage node. We also support uh, with, uh, with Bluster D, which is our, our daemon that um, runs on all the different servers. Yes? The create volume will only run on once, right? I'm sorry? The create volume command, you only run once. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, because, yes, because you're actually running that from the client. On the, um, on the server side, you have to run the pure probe command on all the different servers, and then on the client, you actually run those once. That's true. You don't have to run mount uh, four different times for servers. No, I wrote the Ansible recipe uh, playbook for uh, Gluster, and then. Oh, really? Like, how do I get this to run only once? <laughs> cool. That's awesome. I, I want to talk to you later. I uh, would love to have those uh, 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 recipes or whatever you call it's them. It's still somewhat okay. li uh, linked to the site I'm on, but. Uh, I should introduce you to our, generic enough. I should introduce you to the the puppet Gluster guy because he's working with a lot of the similar things. He can probably <coughs> give you some pointers if you want to to work with him. Um, so, uh, and with Gluster D, uh, you're able to add and remove nodes on the fly, uh, add and remove features on the fly. So if you want to remove uh, uh, the translators running, you know, in process, you can do that. And with 3.4, we finally support rolling upgrades. So. Huzzah. Uh, that, was, that, was a, that was something people have been asking for for, for many years, so I'm glad we were finally able to deliver. Uh, how do we do it? When you look at our, it really comes down to our modularity. If you look on, on the left side, you can see the, uh, the things that are definitely on the client. On the right side are the things that are definitely on the server. And between, you actually have this stack of translators that uh, exist on both. They start out on the server, but what happens is when you connect to a Gluster volume from the client, the client pulls the server and requests the, uh, the volume definition file, which it downloads. And from the volume definition, it reads all the, it reads the configuration and determines what uh, translators it needs to run. And so from the volume definition, again, pulls the uh, server and pulls down the libraries that it needs to run from the client. Uh, so it can be, you know, an active part of the uh, Gluster volume. And, and once it runs those translators, uh, it's able to direct data to where it should go. And that's why we call our, our clients, you know, smart clients, because they're able to determine you know, what's the best path. They don't just all route to the same server and then from the server get routed. Uh, they actually, they're actually able to go directly from the client to whatever node they, they need to reach. Um, so it's, it's a core feature that, uh, that we've been supporting since uh, for several years now. Any question about architecture? Yes? The replication is done by the client or by the service? It's done on the client. But, uh, so, uh, so yeah, the client pulls the server, for, uh, uh, asks for these uh, volume definition file, <coughs> and from the definition file, if replication is part of that volume, then it pulls down the uh, replication library. And so the data path runs through those translators on the client side. So that, and um, for reading, uh, from the client side, uh, it essentially reads from whichever node, whichever replica responds first. So whichever is the first responder. But yeah, that's directed from the client side. Uh, there are several things you can store with those requests. Uh, most common is what we're calling the content cloud. If you need to share uh, files and folders uh, across you know, many different uh, across many different areas, uh, it's a good way to do that. Some of our largest customers use it exactly for this reason. People like Pandora, Limelight, uh, several other content delivery networks. I, I don't know, is Pandora used in, in the EU? It's I, blocked. It's blocked, <laughs> right. It, it, it was just fine until uh, they blocked it. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Uh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, they're one of our largest customers. Um, but basically, all these companies that need to distribute uh, large files, large video files, Images, documents, um, they're, they're very, very much in the, the Gluster Fest user category. Um, and then, it, you know, it, it's what we're calling unstructured data. All these files and folders that are expanding, probably doubling in size year over year. Every year, the amount of storage required for the unstructured data is, I think, uh, increasing by 80%. So it's, it's a big, uh, problem faced by many data centers, and so this gives you a good, uh, Gluster Best provides a good uh, solution to it. 
Um, again, one of our key uh, uh, design principles is uh, the, um, uh, the global namespace, uh, the ability to uh, behave the same way no matter where you're uh, deploying it. So that includes public cloud or private cloud. Um, and in fact, if you're deploying on Amazon just to try something out, uh, it's very easy to deploy on Amazon EC2 and then decide you want to run it locally. Uh, you can basically replicate using Jira replication that volume locally and then just use that local volume as opposed to the one in the sky. <coughs> Uh, well, for, uh, the, I've, I've talked about this before. This kind of shows you the, the diagram of how we attach the global namespace. Um, on the Swift proxy side, uh, we actually had to figure out a way to map uh, the object data to the uh, traditional <coughs> surface storage backend uh, so that when you mount that same data over you know, NFS or the Surface client, you're actually interacting with the same data that, that the, Swift, uh, the Swift client is. We, so about a year ago, we did not have a good OpenStack integration story. We, it was basically, if you mounted ClusterFS, you can use, you know, the, um, you can basically, when you deploy OpenStack, uh, you can tell it to, you know, look for uh, virtual machines hosted on a ClusterFS mount point. Um, the same for Glance, <coughs> the same for Swift, for that matter. Um, uh, since that time, although at that a year ago, we did have the Swift integration in place. That's something we've been doing for about the last two years. But we didn't have something in place specifically for the other two uh, storage, uh, act, uh, storage pieces in, in OpenStack. Uh, since that time, uh, in addition to the Swift integration, we've also done the integration for all the other uh, storage pieces in OpenStack, including Cinder, uh, including Glance. Uh, and then more recently, we've actually done a Nova integration so that you can uh, spin up uh, VMs directly on, on the Western volume. Um, it's been, the amount of progress we've been able to make in the last year is, is pretty, uh, has been pretty, pretty good. Uh, we've been very happy with that. Um, so now you, whatever, uh, whatever storage method you're using uh, in OpenStack, uh, you were able to use you know, block storage cluster, you were able to use the uh, image repository of clusterfs uh, in addition to Swift. Um, that's going to increase because we're going to be, we're also participating in the Manila project in OpenStack, and Manila is all about file systems as a service uh, and making file systems accessible to you know, multiple um, uh, OpenStack uh, uh, VMs. Uh, we're also participating in the Savannah project, and Savannah is all about making Hadoop scalable uh, on top of OpenStack, and so that's another thing we're, because we're very um, we're very much uh, interested in the uh, uh, the whole big data side of the house and be able to use ClusterFS to store big data, including uh, with Hadoop deployments. So, any uh, any questions about uh, OpenStack integration? You may hear using OpenStack. Okay. Um, um, one only user. Well, what you mentioned that um, it's possible to use ClusterFS uh, to know what. So yeah, I should virtual machines directly and and ClusterFS without having to go through our plans. Yeah, well the um, uh, because we uh, with libgf API, which is something else that I'm getting to later, uh, we did the we integrated um, Nova with libgf API uh, uh, so that. Uh, Sorry, let me back up. Nova utilizes the QMU integration with the yeah. So if you're using KVM, uh, and you know, Nova will utilize the, the, the QMU integration, so it will go through the API, and it won't have to, you don't have to worry about having a mount point that uh, will, you know, is where the, the VMs will be deployed. So it'll go directly through, it'll speak directly to the cluster protocol uh, via QMU, and deploy VMs directly on the, on the bus volume. Hopefully it, it works as well as I say it does. <laughs> but uh, if you want to try it out, it's only. So about a year ago, when we, were, when we were talking about Grizzly, we just had the Swift piece. We were just working on a Cinder and Lance integration. 
uh, the sender integration, uh, I think, was pretty rudimentary. It worked. It did not use the libgpp IPs because they had not been released by us yet. Um, and the QMU part had not been released yet either. Uh, so it was just sort of your, your basic you know, mount point and stuff. Uh, Havana was the one that I call the real one because it's the one that's actually useful. Uh, it's, it's the one where we, we actually baked in the node integration uh, and we, uh, we improved the sender integration so I think we, we support more uh, of, of, of what sender supports. Um, and the Swift part continued uh, to the point where what we're calling the Gluster Swift uh, package is essentially just this, is essentially the same as the Swift package that's upstream in the Swift project. And our goal in the next year is to make it so that it's absolutely the same, so you can uh, deploy ClusterFS, deploy Swift directly from you know the Swift guys, and they'll just work together. Um, and we're actively participating in that upstream project. We have two committers to the Swift project uh, to help make that happen. And they've been a really great team to, to work with, I would say. Uh, another thing I mentioned, um, the way self healing works is that when uh, when one replica, when one node of a replica goes down, it comes up, pulls the other, uh, its uh, sort of uh, equivalent node in the other replica, and it looks into the docklustfs directory to look for uh, some links to the files that have changed since it went down, and that's how uh, it heals them. Uh, <coughs> I made a mistake on the slide. Who wants to tell me what it is? Um, uh, the distributed replicate and go are, are reversed. It should be uh, replicated and then distributed. But anyway. Uh, again, going along the theme of global namespace and no data silos, if you run MapReach jobs with Hadoop, you should be able to store them on Gluster volumes. Uh, uh, at the same time, if you have a Gluster volume and you uh, deploy Hadoop, you should be able to uh, access the existing data sets that you have on ClusterFS and make them available for MapReduce jobs on Hadoop. So it goes bi-directionally. Um, it's very convenient if you want to make your data sets available across multiple toolkits. Uh, you don't have that we don't have to copy around a bunch of data just to make it available to the different tools you like to use. Um, again, it's it's really about you know your data and be able to use it your way. So yes. Can I use um, HTFS or cluster FS instead of H uh, HTFS? Yes, you can use it. Replace it yes. completely with cluster. Yes, there are some obvious caveats there. Like we, at this point, we don't scale as much as HTFS. Our replication is not as good as HTFS. Uh, but for specific data sets that you want to make available, um, it's it's a really good uh, solution. So. You can use it in conjunction too. Like there's, you can have one part of your data living on the cluster volume and another part living on, you know, vanilla HDFS. So. Uh, that this sort of goes through things that things that are specific to 3.4. Um, some of which I've already touched on, so I'm just going to move right along. Uh, how am I doing on time? You yeah, have 15 minutes. 15 minutes. All right. Cool. Max. All right. Uh, so we talked about the QMU integration. Uh, so again, the, the IBM guys showed up, uh, three guys who work out of Bangalore, showed up and said they want to do this thing, where, and by this thing I mean they want to implement a Gluster protocol in QMU. And we thought, great, uh, by all means, do, do whatever you want. Uh, and then they said, well, you know, it'd be much easier if we had, if we had an API we could talk to instead of having to run these, like, essentially, you know, command line system calls you know, to you know, going through the Gluster request client over to Mount Point, uh, you know what? You're right. Uh, it would be much easier, wouldn't it? Uh, so we we revived a previously uh, existing project uh, called the the lib client, lib Gluster request client. I think was was always called. We had abandoned it um, around the 3.0 days because uh, it, we didn't have the guy people to, to work on it. Uh, but now that we had a really good reason to work on it. We revived it and we said, sure, we'll create this client library that you can connect to. And so now we have a, a QMU integration to show for it. Um, and there's essentially three parts of this integration. There's the QMU protocol piece, which uh, IBM implemented. There's the GF API piece that we implemented. And there's another piece, the, uh, uh, the block device translator on Gluster volumes that was also implemented by the IBM engineers. So it's a, 
sort of three pieces of that integration and it's been that, that was our key uh, new feature for 3.4. This is a very bad diagram uh, from one of the engineers that sort of illustrates the difference between your standard QMU model and the, the Gluster Bat QMU model. So the, the star of this uh, integration is LibGib API. Uh, it started off, you know, like I said, it was a previously abandoned project, revived just for the QMU integration piece. And since then, we've realized that this could be the key to all integrations going on going forward. And so since that time, we've also used it for the uh, SAM integration. There's, um, there's now a SAM integration that using the SAMBA VFS layer, uh, which I think uh, all Samba releases post 4.1, uh, it'll be there by default. If you want to use the, if you want to use the GF API integration with Samba 3.6, uh, we have a project on the Gluster Forge where you can download uh, that integration code and rebuild Samba and utilize the uh, GF API integration. Uh, how does it work with CDDB? Ah, you'll have to ask one of the people who, could actually, who actually do the work. Uh, but in fact, there's a big thread on the Gluster users over the past week about that very topic. Um, there's also a, a, an active project to integrate CloudStack with the GF API, uh, with the GF API uh, library. Uh, there's um, uh, Gennetti. Uh, there's the, uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, Open Nebula. They're, they've also been... Uh, We've also been uh, working on an integration project. Uh, Zen, so it looks like, you know, this is kind of like the key to uh, delivering uh, virtual block storage capability to a lot of different uh, software stacks. So. I mentioned that the latency with LibJV API is much less than the latency with the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Fuse-based uh, GlusterFest client. And this sort of illustrates why. If, if you look at the GlusterFest client and how it uses the, the Fuse module, uh, you can see that when you do a data lookup, a file lookup, and you calculate the number of context switches uh, during the round trip there and back, it adds up to 14. And uh, so, you know, for, for most things, you're talking about fairly large files, you know, the number of lookups you're doing is not that much. Um, it's not a big deal. For, for most of our you know, customers that are storing these large files, and it's mostly reads, uh, you know, a little bit of write, and, but mostly read, uh, not random I.O. is a key thing. As long as it's not random I.O., then the number of lookups is you know, sane, not you know, fairly trivial. Uh, and so the latency is, is not a big deal. Um, however, for other workloads, latency is a really big deal, especially when you're de dealing with a lot of small files when you're dealing with virtual machines that change a lot, uh, databases, that sort of workload, uh, it, it can be, uh, the latency can be a, big, a, a killer. Uh, so when you implement GF API and then you calculate the number of context switches during a round trip, it's significantly lower. It, it adds up to eight. Uh, so that's why for certain <coughs> workloads, GF API is, is a much better solution than what we had previously. Uh, split frame quorum. So we, we had, um, starting with 3.3, we implemented a pretty rudimentary uh, quorum based uh, uh, management system for GlusterFS. Uh, it required that you have Replica 3, uh, except the problem was that Replica 3 didn't work very well, so uh, we kind of didn't really recommend anyone use it. But then starting with uh, 3.4, uh, we uh, we significantly enhanced that so you didn't have to have Replica 3. You could actually use quorum-based management with a Replica 2 uh, volume. And the way we did that was we implemented sort of a, a non-data node uh, that runs translators, but exists solely to determine quorum, so, or solely to determine you know, who has quorum in, in it, say, a split brain scenario. If you want to stop writing on a specific node, uh, the, what I call a faux node, uh, we'll be able to determine that so you can write to the right one and, and stop writing to the other one. Um, all of our quorum-based features are, uh, are only, have to be specifically enabled. They do not run by default. You have to enable them uh, in the configuration files. Um, but we've now gotten to the point where 
uh, you can run quorum based management for any kind of cluster volume. Uh, it's not just for it's not just for the the initial case of you know stop preventing split brain, uh, but for any kind of you know management change that you need to uh, carefully ma uh, carefully manage or lay out. Uh, it allows you to do that. So I guess it's a sort of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, a lot of people, when it comes to split brain things, uh, don't like the automated uh, features for you know quorum based anything. So they, they like to do manual resolutions. Uh, in that case, you know maybe it's not for you, uh, but some people really do like it. So you don't hear how to deal with split brain situations in the past. Yeah. Okay. How'd you resolve it? Um, <laughs> with help from the <laughs> RC channel. And just, yeah, I had uh, some directories where I saw like the dot and the dot dot directory being six times in the directory and ended up removing everything manually and manually fixing yeah. everything and it was a help. <laughs> how, how long ago was that? A uh, couple of months. Oh, okay. Interesting. Did you use any of the quorum based? Uh... Yeah, I have three nodes uh, okay. with Replica 3. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> but it was probably yeah, I... fucked up by uh, by manual interaction or the, uh, I think what originally was went wrong is um, two bricks were mounted in the wrong wrong location because uh, after a reboot the disk names were changed and I didn't <laughs> mount them on UUID but on path. Uh, interesting. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's fixed now. They're now. I was gonna say. <laughs> hopefully, it's better now, right? <laughs> what version was that? Uh, three three, I think. Oh really? Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, how many of you have ever used Overt? Good, okay. So beginning with Overt 3.1, there was a basic integration where you could deploy LustreFS volumes using Overt. Uh, that has since matured to the point where now, I think with Overt 3.3 and 3.4, you can not only deploy new cluster volumes, you can actually import existing cluster volumes and manage them from the Overt interface. And I know that when you're deploying Overt, you can, uh, there are two different deployment methods. One is the standard way, which is you know virtualization stack management. But then there's a storage only way. So you can actually use over it just to manage your cluster volumes. And it's been a really uh, fruitful uh, collaboration with that team. Uh, I've been really uh, amazed at what they've been able to do. Uh, it also allows you to uh, utilize a RESTful API to manage cluster volumes so you don't have to go through the cluster uh, CLI if you don't want to. Uh, encryption. We introduced wire, one wire encryption in 3.3 uh, via a uh, integration with OpenSSL. And uh, I always get asked this, so I need to mention we are working on uh, an at rest encryption method. Um, I don't think it's ready for 3.5, but uh, hopefully for 3.6 uh, it will be available. Uh, I, need to I need to change that last bullet on the slide, don't I? You can probably already do that at the moment by using encrypted block devices, or? Uh, you know, I don't know, probably. Yes. Um, I, I've never tried it, so. Uh, as, long, as long as you still need an XFS file system on top of something on the cluster D, if you have locks behind, that's yeah. automatically encrypted on the block mm -hmm. device. Oh, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And then we have, in beta, currently, we have LustreFS 3.5. Uh, we just released beta 2, I think, I think it was Monday, earlier this week. So I recommend that everyone try it right now. Uh, <laughs> why are you why are listening to me? You don't, uh, um, one of the key features of that is the newly rewritten geo-replication -re -re module. Um, it uses uh, a change log based uh, replication. Uh, everything we're doing for replication is moving to a change log based model, uh, which will eventually allow us to do uh, ordered uh, replication. Right now it's not ordered. Uh, but in order to you um, uh, know in, in order to do things like file versioning and volume level snapshots, the uh, the uh, the change log based uh, replication will be a, a great help. Um, so that's 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 one major feature. The other is the on wire decompression and compression, uh, so that you can uh, compress data in, on in between uh, points A and B. Yes. In that case, on on wire compression decompression. Then your native files, in fact, your interface to the native files are just broken. Really? Or not? Well, I'm asking you, can you, uh, if uh, your uh, cluster is going away, uh, can you, um, can you screen, 
It should be fine because we're not talking about uh, compressing the data on disk. We're talking about between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so because so the rush, so the, so the decompression will serve. Yeah, it has to, it has to decompress you know, before it gets rid of the disk. So, um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, at least I hope it doesn't break the, because uh, that would be really stupid. <laughs> Um, and then file level snapshots, uh, which should help for uh, if you're again for virtualization uh, uh, workloads where you're storing VMs on the cluster of us. Um, for 3.6, we are working on volume wide snapshots, which will be really fun. Uh, and so, yeah, so continuing on in that same vein, uh, these are things we're uh, working on for future versions. Um, Multi-master GeoRep is the one that everyone keeps asking about with every release. And it's one that <laughs> initially targeted 3.4 and then 3.5 and now we're we at 6. <laughs> um, I, we really should be able to do it this year. Uh, because we've got you know, enough people looking at it that uh, we should be able to implement it. Um, but along with that, volume, volume snapshots, which I mentioned, file versioning, dispersed volume. We've actually got a, uh, a team, uh, there's a company out of Spain uh, they start contributing uh, this feature. It's on the Gluster Forge uh, under the forge.gluster.org slash disperse. Uh, and they're actually going to allow you to, um, so for replication, right now it's mirroring. It's essentially RAID 10. Uh, but they'll be able, what they'll allow you to do is, is RAID 4 or 5 over a network. So, so if you have you know, one volume that would ordinarily take up you know, four nodes and you want to replicate it, then it'll just require an additional two nodes as opposed to you know, an additional four. So it's the basic premise. Right now it works, it's not fast, uh, but if you want to try it out, they just uploaded a new version this past week. <coughs> did you? Did I answer your question? Oh, it, it was my, oh. also about the uh, dispersed volume, that's uh, more or less a rate replacement, than, uh, because right now if you, you make an architecture based on the cluster FS, you still have to use rate yeah. as storage. We'll, no, we, you we will still recommend rate because uh, if you have a drive fail, which right. everyone has drives that fail, especially when you talk, start talking about that scale, it allows you to plug in a new drive harmlessly without having to mess with you know, a software terminal somewhere. Um, so we're still going to recommend that, but uh, when it comes to replicate volumes, it will allow you to save space. Yeah? Uh, very stupid question. I'm looking at ob um, object stores. Yeah. And um, take company called Spectralogic have an object store uses their LTFS files. Could you imagine using a um, tape for one of your um, volume? Um, yeah, actually. Um, with LTFS? I, I'm, it wouldn't be fat. I would say yeah, no, 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 but, but you're not using tape for speed. You're using no. tape for you know, archival purposes. And uh, I, I want to say that there are customers who do that, but I don't know for sure. So, But I can uh, uh, confirm that for you. And you know, what we're really driving at is what we're calling intelligent storage. The ability, people are, uh, the, the wall between compute and storage is rapidly dissolving uh, to the point where people want to run applications directly on their storage nodes. They don't want, they don't want the storage uh, node, uh, you know, EMC piece sitting in a corner somewhere separate from everything. They want to be able to run their applications on the storage boxes. They want to be able to send the compute resources to be closer to the data uh, so that you don't have latency killing you for, for certain types of workloads. Um, and so we need to be part of that. And that's sort of the benefit of the you know, open software defined storage uh, uh, methodology in that you can put your storage anywhere and vice versa, you can put your virtualization uh, or workloads <coughs> anywhere you want. Uh, you can merge them together however much you want. Uh, you can tier them how you want. You have so much more control now over your data placement and control than you ever did uh, previously. Uh, who likes uh, open source governance? So uh, when, when we were acquired by Red Hat, we were you know, a single company, a single project. Uh, that company owned everything on the project. Uh, and you know, all the engineers in that project worked for that single company. Since then, we've, we've you know, grown a lot. We've scaled out a lot. Uh, and, uh, and so we needed a new governance model to, that reflected this change. We, we needed a way to, uh, to bring in more organizations uh, and so that they could you know, help us with the governance piece. We needed a way for more engineers to uh, contribute to the project. 
And we also needed a way to integrate more projects under the Gluster umbrella. And I'll get to the driving force behind that um, when I talk to you. Actually, well, I'll talk about this first. So uh, I don't need to talk about that. <laughs> We're actually going to combine all these different projects into a software distribution because there are all these sort of related projects that exist uh, that are complementary to Gluster Best that are useful to you know, our community. <coughs> we want to make them easier to for people to deploy with GlusterFS. Yes? I don't know how much slide you still have, but you were, you were just out of time. I'm just going to forward to right there. Yeah. <laughs> forward to GlusterFS.org, <laughs> <laughs> because that's what I was driving to anyway. Uh, because I realized that I found this uh, project called PMUX out of Japan, and it's you know file-based MapReduce. You over-distribute Gluster volumes. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. There should be a way for Gluster users to find this stuff easily. And that was kind of the uh, uh, that was that was what drove the decision to to create the Gluster Forge, Forge at Gluster Org. Right now, there are over 40 projects. Um, try one now, uh, including uh, Gluster Swift and a HTTPS plugin, and lots of other stuff. So, thank you. Any questions? All right, let's go drink. Oh, sorry, if you have a question, <laughs> then we can drink. <laughs> what about scrubbing, like uh, systems like uh, ZFS or uh, GPFS? They have scrubbing to see if your data is okay. Uh, that's so. We are implementing a bit rock detection piece that's probably going to be in three point six. Um, so it's not something we have currently, but we are actively working on it for the next release. Cool. Thank you.